The cosmic microwave background radiation, we call it the CMB for short. Um, this is radiation that we measure. It's a relic of the Big Bang. The way that it was produced in the early universe, we'll talk about on Wednesday, but it does have significance toward the um, density of our universe. And that's the thing I wanna highlight today. But first of all, you need to know what it is. So um, the CMB is light that existed only when photons, um, you know, packets of light, were able to decouple from matter in the early universe. So for reasons we'll talk about on Wednesday, this happened at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe was at a temperature of 3000 Kelvin. And since that time, the universe has expanded. And so because of the cosmological redshift, the wavelength of that initial light has been stretched. So now at this point, um, the temperature is about 2.73 Kelvin and the wavelength of the light is about two millimeters. So this is why we call it a microwave background because it's in the microwave range. Um, cosmic because we measure it from all parts of the sky and background because I think that's also because we measure it from all parts of the sky. So this radiation was actually, oops, sorry, predicted in the 1950s, um, theoretically. And then in 1965, Penzias and Wilson were working for Bell Labs, right? They were trying to create better telephone networks. And um, they had the, this weird antenna that you see in the background. Um, and they were basically measuring, they were scientists, but they were measuring um, microwave sources because they were trying to improve telecom. Um, but there was a persistent source of noise in all of their measurements and they tried everything to get rid of this noise, um, even down to cleaning all the bird poop out of their antenna, which they called white dielectric material. Um, and they couldn't get rid of the noise even then. And so it was not until someone else helped them connect to the theory of the CMB that they were um, able to put two and two together that this was actually a real signal that just pervaded all of the entire sky. And this eventually earned them the 1978 Nobel Prize. So I think the moral of this story is you don't always have to be looking for something specific to make an important discovery. Sometimes you can just be fooling around for some other reason and stumble on something incredible. Okay, so the CMB represents the earliest possible image we have of the universe. So I like to think of it as the universe's baby picture because before that matter was too dense and radiation could not escape. And so the background radiation is the earliest possible measurement that we have, the oldest light that we measure from the entire universe. And everything since then, all the quasars that we measure at high redshift, all of those active galaxies and also the nearby galaxies, all of those are you know, much more recent light. Okay, so the CMB is, like I said, measurable from the entire sky because it was the, the earliest light released. So it comes from everywhere because everywhere has been expanding. Um, and it's uniformly distributed. So it has a constant temperature of almost three Kelvin everywhere, but the temperature is not perfectly uniform. And so these images that we look at of the CMB are illustrating the cool spots and the hot spots within the signal. So those cool spots are represented in these types of maps by blue. And so those are places where some of the light energy was lost to creating mass, as we'll talk about next time. And that means that there's more mass in those cool regions. Um, and so those are regions that are rich in mass. And therefore, these are uh, where the seeds for galaxies and galaxy clusters are. So when we look at the CMB, all these little cool spots are areas where galaxies and galaxy clusters formed. And all these hot spots are the voids. So I think that's pretty incredible that we can actually tie the structures that we see today to this baby picture of the universe. Okay, so as we're looking outward from the Milky Way back into the past, we see our normal galaxies nearby, we see the active galaxies and then the quasars at high redshifts, and then finally the CMB is the last thing we can see. So let's say that you're in a different distant galaxy far, far away looking outward, what would you see from there? Okay, I see the most votes for E. And that's exactly right. There's no privileged position in the universe 
So any other galaxy's view is essentially the same as our view, except obviously different objects around because it's in a different part of space. Um, but the important point here is that this sort of pizza slice image, this is not showing a map of the universe as it is now. This is just a slice in, I guess, in distance, but also in time. And it's because those those concepts of distance and time are connected that we have this arrangement of things that we see deeper and deeper in space because that's deeper and deeper into the past. But it's not, um, it's not as if we're looking farther and farther in a particular direction only, right? We see this type of pizza slice in every direction we look with the CMB being sort of at the outside of that. If you, if you wanted to think of it like this was a slice, then you'd think there's a whole sphere and around the whole sphere, we measure the CMB. Um, and it's, it's just a, I think, I don't know, limitation of the human mind to imagine that, you know, it's not as if, if we move to a distant galaxy, we don't, for example, end up over here on the map or something and therefore see active galaxies nearby and normal galaxies and then quasars to the right and normal galaxies to the left, right? Um, and this is because the universe is a three-dimensional expanding space and this is just not something we're equipped to think about with our puny brains, at least me. Um, so we basically see the same arrangement of objects in the Milky Way as in a very distant galaxy. Um, but this is the only conclusion that's consistent with that cosmological principle. All right. So back to the CMB. So we've got um, hot spots and cold spots. And we can measure the whole map of the sky by basically measuring in every single direction and make a map. That's what that oval situation is, is illustrating is different locations on the sky. Um, and if we do that, we know how big the whole sky is in terms of angle, right? 360 degrees around in every direction. And so we can measure the size of the hot and cold spots by measuring their angular extent on the sky. So maybe they're large, maybe they're medium sized, maybe they're very small. And it turns out for reasons that I'm not equipped to explain at all, that the angular size of those spots corresponds to the density of the universe. Um, so I guess maybe it sort of makes conceptual sense that if you have a very high density, then the spots end up being larger. A lot of mass is able to gather together quickly if there's a lot of mass around, right? But if you have a low density, maybe you have very small spots because that mass is not a very effective at clustering up because there's just not a lot of it to gravitationally pull together. So anyway, the angular size that we measure corresponds to the density. And because we have extremely refined models of cosmology, then we can calculate the density based specifically on these spot sizes. All right, so um, I wanna talk about the, I guess, geometry of space-time as it connects to this idea. So if you have a very high energy universe, then two rays of light, let's say they're initially um, sent out from the CMB and they're initially parallel when they leave our early universe um, coming toward us in the future they get squeezed together as the universe collapses if we have a high density, right? That's the idea that we're gonna end in a big crunch. Everything has to, all those lights will come back together. So this um, connects to geometry in the following way. If I draw a sphere, then parallel lines on a sphere also end up connecting, right? And so what we say about the geometry of space-time at very high densities is that it has a spherical shape. It doesn't mean that it's a, a, like a three-dimensional sphere, right? It's an, a three-dimensional sphere evolving in time. It's, it doesn't really help to think about it as a, as a literal sphere, um, but the geometry we call spherical because it's an analogy. Okay, um, the critical density universe in a critical density universe, we would have two rays of light that are initially parallel and they would remain parallel forever. And so this is consistent with a flat surface. So we call a critical density universe flat. And then the last possible space-time geometry 
it corresponds to low density. And if we have a low density universe, then two rays of light, if they're initially parallel, will spread apart because the universe is expanding, right? The density isn't enough to hold the expansion to a steady rate. So it expands faster and faster. So those light rays get farther and farther apart, never to meet again. And this occurs on what we call a hyperbolic space, which is kind of the shape of a saddle. If you drew two lines starting from somewhere on the saddle, then they would diverge and never meet again. So we say that the geometry of a low density universe is hyperbolic. Okay. So based on the reading, what do we know about the CMB measurements and what critical or what um, density we have compared to critical? All right. So it turns out that based on our best, most refined CMB measurements, um, we have critical density. We live in a flat universe. The two parallel rays will never converge. And this means something about the fate of our universe. If we live in a flat critical density universe, what's gonna happen? Okay, so I see the most votes for B, that in a flat critical density, we expand slowly until we reach a maximum size. And so that's what we would expect from a flat critical density universe, because if we have higher than critical density, we're going to big crunch. Um, that's not going to happen. We don't have higher than critical density. Uh, maybe this is good news because it means that things do not end in, um, I don't know, fire. Um, but maybe that's less exciting because a big crunch universe could rebake itself, which I think is a little bit helpful. Um, so if we have less than critical density, we're going to um, expand, but we're never going to sort of ever stop, even in the infinite, infinite future. Um, so it's definitely not accelerating its expansion forever. Um, and it's not going to somehow reach a constant expansion rate. But instead, a critical density universe just expands slowly, slowly toward some maximum size at t equals infinity. All right. So this can be a little bit confusing, um, but we're expanding slowly toward a maximum size. And there is an article that I could share with you that ex tries to explain how it could be true that we're currently expanding or accelerating in our expansion, but that we're not gonna do that forever. And that over time, the expansion rate continues to fall. Um, the exact explanation for that is a little bit hard for me to articulate. So I think, you know, the whole team can work together on this one, I guess. Um, but to the best of my understanding, the idea that we have accelerated in our expansion doesn't mean that we have to accelerate forever. If we had a lot of dark energy, we would accelerate forever. But it turns out that we have just enough dark energy to have accelerated some. And after that, uh, we reach a state where we continue expanding forever, but the expansion rate falls. So Hubble's constant gets smaller and smaller over time. Okay, so based on the discussion of these four different models in these three different representations, um, I want you to just put it together in one more activity uh, because personally, I found it uh, a little bit difficult to piece these together into a coherent understanding. And so I hope that you'll construct an understanding for yourself here.